I want to welcome everyone back to the Pete Quinona Show. I'm here with Cat Girl Kulak. How you doing, Kulak? I'm doing pretty good. How are you, Pete? Doing well. Doing well. First time on the show. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, I am a famous Twitter cat girl. Um, I write very extreme articles over at my blog in Arcanomicon, and I have a abiding obsession with public choice theory, uh, libertarian theory, and guerrilla warfare. Okay. Okay. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's three items. It's a short list. Yeah. Well, here's something I haven't really talked about a lot in probably a few years, just because uh, I've been all over the place. I, I probably talked about it recently. Um, not recently, but within three years. But um, you on your sub stack, you put out, and I guess this is, uh, you, you wrote that this is a part of a, a bigger piece and you you entitled this the unfunded liability death trap and this is the kind of stuff that when i first became a libertarian in 2007 2008 i would find these articles and just devour them and then it was just it just gets to the point where you're like i've read all these articles what's it's gonna what how different is it going to be the numbers are just going to be larger but no no now you know, some of the things that um some of the things you point out in here that if they're not fixed uh we're headed for a lot bigger problem so um why don't, why don't you tell everybody what's the bigger piece that you're th that this is a part of well the bigger piece it's a part of is um base that's a longer longer story bigger piece it's part of is basically me trying to map out what's going to happen to the u.s in the next 15 ish years it's not going to be pretty but um to the this piece is a very good introduction to what you need to know um basically as you mentioned this stuff has been talked about since 2008 um anyone who's an old veteran of the ron paul days or like paid attention to that time or hell like read Paul Ryan, the one time he used this for his branding, branding like knows the story of this stuff. But um, I really wanted all my readers to like get caught up because no one's really talked about it since like 2015 or so. Um, basically, the U.S. federal government, everything that all the main programs of the U.S. federal government, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, federal employee pensions, uh, the VA, um, pensions for veterans, all that combined, all of those programs were set up in the 1950s to depend on 1950s demographics. And basically, we've known since 2000, if not before, that those would be completely unsustainable and would collapse under their own weight by 2030, if nothing was done about them. About them. You can read articles from 2008 saying, oh, by 2030, these will have failed. You can read policy proposals saying, from 2012 saying, well, if we just instituted these policies, if we just, um, if we allowed an opt out from Social Security and allowed an opt out from Medicare and implemented, you know, a planned buyout that the way that insurance companies do settlements that at 65, instead of starting to accept Social Security, you just accept a lump sum. And then, and then that would save us money over the long terms. Then we could make this work and like get to somewhere where it's all maintainable without the entire country collapsing, basically. And these were policy pros proposals throughout the 2000s, throughout 2010 to 2015. And none of them were implemented because all of them would involve the government shedding responsibilities and shedding uh, powers to tax in ways associated with all these welfare benefit programs. And so they're a complete non-starter for the government. As soon as you start shedding these responsibilities, suddenly you have to start shedding personnel and mandates. And suddenly, you know, the public can really start asking what's happening with their tax dollars because suddenly that base of old people who are depending on those programs would start to evaporate. So none of that was done because the government depends on these programs for their legitimacy. So what was predicted to happen is starting to happen. We're seeing this with inflation now. We're seeing 
seeing this with just the rate at which um, they call them unfunded liabilities. So there's the the federal debt, which is which is funded liabilities or rather explicit liabilities that have already been paid out. And now someone owns a bond and is collecting interest on them. These are unfunded liabilities. These are promises that have been made, but the money hasn't been paid out yet. So you don't have to pay interest on it, but the liability itself is growing because these promises are structured to grow eternally because they, they assume 1950s demographics and there will always be 16 workers for every one retiree when really we're getting closer to two workers for one retiree. But um, basically the story that your listeners needs to know is that none of this is news. None of this is, is like something crazy or new. I'm telling you all this is stuff that there were hundreds and hundreds of articles written about from 2008 to 2015 and dozens before that. And maybe hundreds since since then um academic papers policy papers you can even go to places like cato which like aren't very good but like they've written papers on this even like american enterprise institute and heritage which are just like mainstream basic bitch conservatism they've all written stuff on this and how this is going to collapse collapse america or at least they would say that back in 2012 when it was still very speculative but basically none of these problems were dealt with and all of them were expanded or made worse by COVID and all kinds of spending programs that were implemented. So Obamacare expanded the expenses associated with Medicare and Medicaid, for example. So, so we've had this Armageddon of American unsustainable finances that have been building up. And what I'm saying is right now is not we have to do something or there could be a policy that could be implemented to avert this right now it's no brace for impact that that timeline of 2030 was basically exactly right on and we're going to hit it by about 2030. Yeah, when you mention the unfunded liabilities you have things like social security medicare medicaid u.s debt federal employee benefits i wonder how many people know that like the executive branch of the government alone is like 2.1 million people, 2.1 million employees, and they're all going to get a uh, they're all going to get a pension, and they all get benefits. Well, it's even worse than that because um, basically the way federal employees pay is structured is um, there are a lot of federal employees that are paid obscene obscene amounts, like like there are a few that make half a mil, but the vast majority of them actually make like kind of a pitiful pitiful amount, like um you know, 60, 80, 80,000, 100,000, which like isn't bad, but you know, some of these people have like three degrees or so. It's not, not obviously like an incredible amount for the amount of effort they put into getting some of these positions. But the big thing, the reason you become a federal employee is that your pension is paid out. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's still paid out on the salary of your last day of employment or the last year about. And so all these federal employee, employees, basically if you're a federal employee, what you do is you take your income and spend every fucking dime of it. Like you don't have a 401k, you don't you don't do any any of that. You don't um you don't have a Roth IRA. You spend it because you have this gold-plated pension plan that's coming and basically every dollar that comes your way way is just a way to to spend it or you take out debt in against that future your income that you're 100 percent guaranteed to get because because you're paid a pitiful amount now to make the numbers look good of like no we aren't paying our federal employees this obscene amount of money but then as soon as you retire or as you get older, you have this guaranteed massive income that no one else would ever get. That still looks kind of marginal, but because it's 100% guaranteed, you can take out loans against it. You can do all these financial shenanigans. Statually, like a federal employee, $80,000 a year for anyone else would be the equivalent of $200,000 a year. Because it's secured, you know you're going to make, make more as you age, and you're going to make more after you retire. So in a way, it's 
like the structure of federal employee compensation is an end run around the income tax that these guys are making the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars dollars in real spendable money but they only have to report like 60 to 80 80k and a lot of, you can probably look up guides on how to do do this how to max out your your debt in such a way that your federal pension will cover it and stuff how to structure your mortgage so that will actually be a 30 year long mortgage and all these tricks that federal employees employees do but when you look at it that way the like the possibility that you could just cut federal employee pensions like these people will fight to the death over it because that's like in their mind that's their compensation for years of employment where they they're making yet less or they've actually taken out debt against it against it so like you can't really cut cut that same with social security a lot of people made their financial plans based around the idea that social security would be be so secure be so t so tight and all those aging boomers the only ones who really vote in extreme numbers and consistently as a block they'll all fight to the death for it uh medicare and medicaid um those cover poor people and the and the elderly they're they're both like very aligned voting blocks so there's pretty much no way to get rid of any of these liabilities except for inflation or civilizational collapse like basically you can inflate it away but a lot of it's indexed to inflation or you can can like soft inflate it away through through all these asset bubbles that destroy cost of living or like drive up the the cost of everything but in a way that it doesn't affect official cpi the official cpi has been basically a lie for for a decade now like if you had to include housing and several different asset classes i don't even think food is included in cpi any, anymore if you had to include all that cpi would be through through the roof would be around 20 percent inflation and and basically the third way that you could get rid of that um that expanding cost is what's probably going to happen is a civil war um there's basically what we're going to see within the next six years six years maybe eight maybe one if this starts kicking off very quickly but if there's one thing i've learned trying to predict this stuff is that the markets never become rational like um i remember in 2012 everyone was thinking well by 2015 it'll become obvious that this is unsustainable we'll pass x or y threshold that now it's locked in and then the market will just crash because everyone will know that the value of these assets it will be worth nothing 15 years from now and it's like no the u.s market is so distorted that nothing like that can actually function you know maybe three billionaires were that far sighted but um but no as far as things are gonna gonna go this is the end of the american empire uh there's people like to say that the aircraft carriers and the the u.s surface fleet and the u.s military terry like um oh bitcoin is backed with dreams uh the u.s dollar is backed with 12 aircraft craft carriers because the u.s dollar system itself is so so contradictory because of these massive liabilities basically what will probably wind up happening is those aircraft carriers will wind up wind up being hacked apart for parts or sold sold off or or deprived of men and resources as we're already slowly starting to see with regards to the military like um military wages are not keeping up anywhere near with cost of living and we're just seeing this mass evaporation of people from the fighting force and combat readiness um it any of your readers can look at the uss bonham richards which was a a small aircraft carrier a um an expeditionary combat ship 
was it? Um, it's a small aircraft carrier that the U.S. military uses to carry mar Marines and expeditionary forces to basically you can land land a small army in a box everywhere. If the if the super carriers are an air force air force in a box that can be launched in any war, these were little armies in a box that you could launch anywhere. One of those burned down. The U.S. had had about 15, 20, 20 of these, and one of them just burnt in port. And the only reason you didn't hear about it was because it happened right at the height of the summer of four. Look it up. USS Bonham Richard, a small aircraft carrier, burnt to the ground in port during maintenance due to incompetence and mismanagement and lack of personnel and lack of training. And um, basically it was covered up by the summer of Floyd, and then they tried to cover up responsibility for it by blaming it on arson, which they implied was related to the rioting, but actually wasn't. Wasn't, and it wasn't arson. The private they tried to pin it on uh, was found not guilty, and it was just rank incompetence within the U.S. Navy. But that's the state of readiness of of the U.S. military right now. That small aircraft carriers are burning down in in port. And that's just going to keep getting worse because there's no way to keep the the cost of soldiers living up with the actual cost cost of living without massively increasing expenditure on the army, which can't really happen because the U.S. is already so so pressed for cash and inflation is all already so high that basically what we're what we've been witnessing over the past ten years or since COVID has been the federal government just plundering the last of the money in the system with all these insane spending bills to this carve out for defense contracts, this carve out for Ukraine, this carve out for Pfizer. Uh, a lot of people have conspiracy theories about what's going on, and it's the actual conspiracy behind the U.S. empire is much darker than anyone thinks. It's just rats rats and thieves stealing the last of the cutlery from a sinking ship that everyone basically everyone in dc knows that um none of this none of their financial games are going to cover up uh what's happening in again 2030 and and so they're just just ripping up everything of valuable taking the copper wire out and that's what every one of these spending bills is for. If you look at any policy in DC, why aren't they investing in infrastructure? Why are they doing this or that? Why are the Democrats, you know, destroying their credibility with the public and the viability of the US welfare state by importing tens of millions of illegals all to win, you know, one or two elections? Well, that's why, because everyone knows there's an expiration date on the US federal government. Yeah, I've been saying that this whole thing, especially since Ukraine started, it's just the, I mean, I've been saying since 2008, we're in eluding the treasury phase, but it's, uh, it's expedited. It's gotten, uh, it's gotten worse. So I did want to go back to this. Um, you will hear, and even from some libertarians like the, the Cato Institute, that um, the reason that, the reason we need so many immigrants in here to pay taxes is that you know that's what's going to solve the problem that's what's going to solve the uh, the unfunded liabilities problem we just need to get more people in here because people aren't having enough kids no that's complete bullshit um milton friedman talked about uh illegal immigration in the 80s and a lot of people cite him as like oh libertarians have always been this way but actually what he said at the time made sense which was that illegal immigrations were marginally valuable in the 1980s, as long as they remained illegal immigrants. Uh, at that point, at that point, the average Mexican who was coming across and working was actually coming across and working. And so as long as they remained illegal and weren't able to collect welfare or anything like that, they were, they were just barely net positive, as net positive as as someone picking vegetables in the desert can be be that they 
they were adding valuable then, but that's how marginal they were in the 1980s. Now it's like, if it was just Mexicans coming into America, there wouldn't be a problem. Their crime would slightly rise, but it wouldn't actually be detracting too much from U.S. finances, which are already, it would still be dying, but it wouldn't be detracting too much. The immigrants they're importing now are Guatemalan. Uh, there's a lot of Somalis and um, Sengalish showing up. Uh, just whoever can like get a flight to the Darien Gap or like whoever random NGO geos of a certain of a certain ethnic background or certain religious backings, whichever ones they choose to fly in. Uh, none of those have even the potential to be net positive. None of those were net positive in their own country. Um, there have been a lot of talks that a lot of dictators in the third world are ent emptying out their prisons and giving them one-way plane tickets to to the Darien Gap or to to Nicaragua well, to start the trip up. Is there, a, these... is there an airport in the Darien Gap? I, I think the Darien Gap is supposed to be un, you know, a lot of trouble traversing it. Or, well, or... it's Colombia and Venezuela that they send them to, and then that's why they're crossing the Darien, Darien okay. Gap there. All right. Because, like, like, yeah, the Darien Gap, like, it used to be, like, there were years where it was imp impassable, and, like, you'd hear stories of, like, um, guys who on motorcycles had managed to make it through. And this was considered the equivalent of crossing Everest, but for like cross country motorcycles, because it's just empty jungle. Like there's no road, there's no nothing, nothing like that, that, and it's a death trap. So like one white guy on a motorcycle making through, like there's uncontacted tribes in the Darien Gap. Uh, there's Marxist guerrilla movements from like Colombia that have never surrendered in the Darien Gap. Like that's the kind of place place it is. And basically anyone who's crazy enough to cross the Darien Gap for a shot at at America, they've been poured to Venezuela and Colombia. Colombia and countries have emptied their prisons to like pour them ac across. And the obvious and this should be obvious to your listeners is that anyone who do that to like illegally immigrate to the U.S. is not a net po is not net positive. Like people, like shopkeepers in their home country do not do that. You know, people who got lawyers and doctors do not do that. Uh, guys who have like security guard jobs in Senegal do not do that. It's entirely like the scum of these countries who weren't necessarily who couldn't be net positive in a country with a GDP of like $500 a year, they're making, making this trip. And the honest truth is a lot of people think this is the demographic doom of America. Honestly, with the crisis that's coming, I don't think most of them will survive. But the reason the Democrats and um, the EU types are doing, doing this and importing so many people isn't because because they want to demographically just destroy your country. It's not, it's not because they want to prop up all these welfare programs. It's because they want to get enough illegal voting that can, they can win the one or two elections that are left. And it's probably just one now in most places. Like that's, that's the dark, horrible secret is that it's just so they can vote once. And, and if they can buy those votes once or get enough of them to register it in some shady manner, then it might be, you know, the current crop of elites who hold the levers of power and hold on to and hold on to the military and stuff when all this when the ship capsizes. Like like I cannot express to you how short the time horizons are of most governing decisions right now. Like most of these people like um like the reason the borders are open aren't isn't even the 2028 election it's the 2024 election and if it has any effect on the 2028 election uh they don't know or they don't care this is why it's it spooked them in a lot of 
a lot of countries. Um, basically, any country that um, you have to fly to to get in, no matter how shady the immigration system is, it doesn't even work there. So, um, for example, Canada, Trudeau is not has imported a million immigrants a year to a country of 38, 40 million. And he's not even to se able to secure the voting power there because the ones he's imported either don't vote, can't vote, or like he's, he's even turned off immigrants from 2010 faster than he's been able to import new voters. Like it's only countries like countries in Europe or America where it's you can actually have a flood of people physically crossing that can't even figure out how a plane how to plane to wherever they're going or fill out an application that you can do this and that's again this election uh, these people know that their time is really numbered that we're in for a civil war or something equally horrible within the next four to two, four to six years. And, and they're just trying to hold on to power for two more years to try and keep that going. Realistically, um, I'm always, I'm nervous now about saying, well, realistically, if everyone behaves rationally, like it has to pop off sooner than the final end date, because people see the next move and the move after that, and then they'll they'll behave rationally for the long term but but that hasn't happened so far but realistically like it could be this year that something goes completely nuts looking at at the us that these people are that desperate to to just hold on to power th for the moment of crisis because the basically what happens when all these unfunded liabilities go go tits up is about a million dollars in America. Um, by 2028, 2030, there will be a million dollars in America owed for every man, woman, and child to someone else that is not going to get paid. There will be a million dollars per person that does not exist, that they everyone think, thinks exists. So every man, woman, and child in America can at the moment of crisis, we'll get the equivalent of a million dollars poor. And the obvious thing is, as with any political scenario, is there are going to be winners and losers, or there's going to be survivors and losers. There are going to be people who lose a whole lot more than a million dollars, and there are going to be people who lose a whole lot less than $4 million. There will be some families of four who don't make it out at all, and there will be some families of four who still have their fortunes at the end of it. And, and basically, the reason the federal government, government and the government bureaucracy is doing all this stuff is because they know if, if Trump is in power or anyone else is in power except them at the moment of crisis, well, the obvious thing to do is to just cut every federal p pension, fire all the federal employees, uh, cut off all these corrupt um, carve-outs for various corp corporate interests, slash the military-industrial complex, uh, rally just the soldiers, say, we'll double your pay if you back us to like purge every everyone else. Like there's an obvious realignment and it's the the laptop bureaucratic class having their lunch eaten and having their empire destroyed. Like that's what obviously every American would wish to happen. And then, you know, Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid get cut, but not enough that it's catastrophic for any everyone. But realistically, every organ of the federal machine is fighting tooth and nail to make sure that no, all that money comes out of the public's cost of living that, um, that, you know, housing prices get propped up by people starving in the streets or like 40 year olds living in their parents' basements or homeless encampments, uh, cost of food doubles or 
or quadruples. Um, every business is regulated. Every small business under 500 is regulated out of existence. Basically, all the games you could play to prop up the get the ruling class by destroying the cost of the standard of living of the country. They they're going to try to play it if they have the lever levers of power. This is what um all the great reset green stuff is about. Uh, great reset probably the probably the dumbest version of it. Like Klaus Schwab and them, they're not prophets or or great visionaries or anything, but that's basically what the green agenda exists to do is justify lowering the lowering the standard of living of everyone in the West while creating carve outs that can allow the ruling elite to get rich. This was the purpose of all the wind turbines that don't don't actually produce an electricity of note. This is the purpose of all like the green tech. This is the purpose of electric vehicles, which almost no electric vehicle actually winds up being reducing carbon at all, let alone in any way that's cost effective or proportionate to the expense being placed on them, because almost everywhere has to use some version of fossil fuel to generate electricity to begin with. But the purpose of all these green tech carve outs and all these games is for every one of these government programs, someone's getting rich. And so the the goal of the governing elite right now is to just ensure that you pay it, not not them. And very soon that's going to be the thought process of everyone in America is who can we carve up to feed ourselves? Uh, basically, when Western welfare states start going, it'll... Uh, the wheel of history will start again. Um, if you look at any other era in history that looked like this, where there's a massive debt crisis followed by by the evaporation of a lot of wealth, uh, if you can think of Weimar Germany, you can you can sort of th- think of the First World War. You can think of very much so the French Revolution. Uh, the inevitable con- consequence is that all the factions that are that are either friendly or or in some capacity able to peaceably coexist while playing the game of politics, all suddenly they have to draw all draw their knives because one of them is getting murdered. Uh, and prob- and you can already see this um, with the heating up of Trump's election that um, uh, he's a good follow on Twitter. Stormy Waters has talked about this on his podcast appearances that um, private equity, which in 2016 was either non entity or entirely in the bank of um, Hillary Clinton. Uh, basically all the major bankers in America, the private equity bankers, bankers, not, not all, not other entities, or especially not the Euro bankers. Basically, figures like Jamie Dimon, Goldman Sachs, all these, all these types. They've turned on the ESG stuff with a vengeance and are slowly aligning themselves with Trump because, uh, basically, one of the ways that the the governing elite would like to get out of this financial problem is to inter- implement a central bank digital currency and destroy your purchasing power and, and financial freedom that way. And that's how they'll carve out all this money that's missing from you. But um, none of the private equity banks, none of the New York New York banks, basically anyone who's not, not regime aligned or aligned with... Um, specific states in the Middle East. Uh, none of them want a central bank digital currency because that means the end of banking. Uh, the central bank digital currency, it's all money goes through through a central government repository that's run by government bureaucrats. And the classic role of banking, uh, managing debts and 
and acting as a repository for people's cash, cash, that role functionally disappears. All the power of traditional bank evaporates with that, which the European banks are quite keen on because all the European banks are bankrupt. Basically, every bank in Europe uh, did not get their act together after 2008. Uh, the entire Euro banking system is a house of cards, and this would rec rescue the Euro banking system. The U.S. banking system uh, did get their house together. At least a good percentage of the banks on Wall Street have hard assets now that are actually valuable and have meaningful cash flows that quite matter to the billionaires in charge of New York bank banking. And none of them want to see a central bank digital well, currency. This is why um, Jerome Powell, who's been called private equity Powell, the the first um, the first Federal Reserve chair of his ethnicity, um, the first the first Federal Reserve chair to really come from private banking. The reason he's fought inflation so aggressively and is like actually ripping up a lot of corrupt in institutions by fighting inflation so aggressively is because he's trying to keep the U.S. dollar alive which is 100% necessary for all these private equity banks. And the reason he's doing that is because, A, he's a private equity banker, and B, uh, once his term, uh, once his tenure in the Federal Reserve is over, he's going to be the head of the hedge fund. Basically, that's how he'll, they'll wind up compensating him for it. But, but that entire faction is already breaking with the Federal elite because they need some something resembling American capitalism to continue or something resembling the corrupt cronious American capitalism we have to continue and that means the US dollar continuing but um we're slowly going to see more and more factions break break off and turn on each other this is why Trump's really frightening this time around because he's not just a clown who can like demagogue the voters but like doesn't have anyone backing backing him now there are the hard factions factions backing him that that actually do want to see things like the deep state be the ones who lose this coming con conf conflagration um uh big one backing trump right now is um netanyahu which um You'd think, think well, the Israelis have power on both sides, but Netanyahu specifically needs Trump to win because basically the the more secular centrist left wing Israelis all want Netanyahu out of power and to die in prison, which he almost certainly deserves uh, after both his incompetence leading up to uh, October seventh. Um, his constitutional attack on like what rights did exist in the Israeli non-constitutional system and basically all his, the crimes he's committed. But um, the establishment in Israel wants him, wants him gone. And basically he's throwing every asset the Israeli right has politically towards Trump because Trump's the only hope he has of really holding on to power. He really wants this war in the Middle East to continue through the election. And he really wants Biden, Biden gone. And he thinks, thinks that if Trump's in and he's back Trump, that will really, that'll be like his one way of holding on to power and not getting immediately convicted of corruption and a dozen other things. Uh, Another faction that's slowly aligning with Trump is a lot of the deep office, officer core of the U.S. military because it's just getting drained, drained the entire U.S. fighting force of resources and cap capabilities and like cultural power, power top to bottom because of of the Biden administration's strong push push against its institutional effect. You can see all these alliances starting 
starting to form right now. And uh, the Silicon Valley is divided down the middle. But you can see these lines is starting to form. And all of a sudden, they're becoming very high stakes. Uh, Elon Musk might be the most obvious ex example where like he's playing with his entire fortune on the Twitter game. Like, um, if he, if he manages to, to like actually create a free speech platform that will shift American politics, like f two, three standard deviations to the right. And if that just sustains, you know, four years or one election or just this election cycle, you know, that could determine the outcome of the election and that could determine the fate of American politics through through the coming crisis, but likewise, if he, which is it, which it's looked like at several times that he'd screwed up and done, if he manages to like, if he screws it up or missteps ever so slightly, you know, he could get the entire elite aligned against him, and all suddenly, suddenly, probably doesn't have Twitter, probably has financial problems out the wazoo, probably loses a lot of the government contracts because all his his entire business is defense department con contracts, like re defense department contracts and green carve outs. So Tesla's only make sense as a financial, as a product right now, because there's been dozens and dozens of green schemes to get people buying them. Uh, there were rebates for the longest time. There were, there are subsidies. There were, there are these mandates on other auto manufacturers that they had to produce them as well that acted as a weight weight on them. So Tesla is entirely dependent on gover government regulation, continued good graces, but SpaceX is basically a defense contractor and he's completely dependent on the government's good grace for that as well. So Elon stepping onto the political scene so predominantly risked his entire fortune if they turn on him him, you know, his entire empire could be gone and he could be, he could go from positive $200 billion to negative $50 billion very quickly if he mis misplaces a single foot. But you also see moves like this from, um, from Peter Thiel and you see stuff like this from a lot of, a lot of people, Jamie Dimon, I've already named people taking sides and aligning in ways that you really wouldn't have expected to see billionaires do in the past and alliances forming that are like really hard divisions between them within the American elite that won't go away and will probably turn into massive crevasses within the next two, three years. Uh, I suspect if everyone behaves rationally, you know, uh, we, we lost we, we lost the last uh, about 15 seconds um, after you talked about Musk. You talked about Diamond. Can you um, start over and talk about Diamond? Oh, Diamond. I already mentioned him. He's um. Uh, so Diamond is. Is like trying to turn himself into J.P. Morgan. Like he owns J.P. Morgan Chase, but he's trying to to basically turn his private equity bank into a private fiefdom. Like he's treating it the way a 19th century industrialist would. Um, all his earnings, he's pouring back into JP Morgan Chase, Chase stock and stuff, stuff like that, which none of the other billionaires are doing. All the tech billionaires are piling out of their, their holdings and their companies because they most likely uh, Facebook, Amazon, and all that, their valuation tankers, 50% of more because they depend on these insane tech valuations that are entirely speculative. Um, Google could possibly disappear given that their core functionality has declined so much in value. Like search is their entire business business. Like it's still 90, 95% of all of Google and it's just declined in, in value. And Google's entire valuation is speculative on a AI and stuff like that. And, uh, if there's a market crash, Google loses lots of its value. But what Jamie Dimon has been doing is he's just been pouring his fortune back into JP Morgan Chase. So it could be his private fiefdom and he can make decisions stretching decades 
And he's as much as he could deniably been throwing himself behind Trump and behind the Jerome Powell faction of private private equity. And what I've been meaning to say is that um, all these hard factions are forming and the American elite is not united in any recognizable way. There is no uniparty anymore. And it's quickly falling apart. Um, Rand Paul is running for is looking like he'll be a prime competitor to succeed Mitch McConnell as um, majority head of the Senate, Senate, which would have been like unthinkable for my entire lifetime. But but now all bets bets are off with regards to this stuff. It's really a live conversation. The U.S. has one of the most united elites of anywhere we're in the world. Um, the EU will probably, uh, they're desperately hanging on to their one world government dreams, but realistically, um, the war in Ukraine could end in like a horrifying defeat for the Ukrainians by summer. If you've been following anything that's happening there, um, Russia, Russia has been making steady advances for like the past few months, which are quite remarkable. They've been getting like 500 meters to a kilometer a day, which is like a huge amount for this war. But um, Putin's been lining up his forces. It looks like he's going to open up the entire border with Ukraine between Ukraine and Russia in this war, which if any of your viewers have followed the Ukraine war, um, basically it's been a static war just between Ukraine and Ukrainian territory that was taken by Russia. There's been this entire border between Russia and Ukraine, which has been silent as could be because of a mutual agreement between the two that Ukraine couldn't keep its country stable and Russia, if Russia invaded there and Russia uh, would have to mobilize millions more people that it didn't want to if it, it was pushed. But um, at the moment, Russia... Ukraine is weakened enough and Russia has slowly mobilized enough enough people that looks like Russia is going to double the size of, of the front um, at, at some point in the next few months. And that, you know, it's possible Ucra the Ukrainian government just collapses. It's possible Russia takes up to the Dnipro and takes the, um, the southern coast of Ukraine. Ukraine and basically if the war ends dramatically in Ukraine defeat especially in the next few months that that destabilizes Europe that destabilizes the EU um, there are these elections coming coming up um, that every country in, in the EU all the EU aligned aligned factions in government are trying to to pass increasingly draconian laws to ban dissent. Uh, Canada is doing it, it as well for some bizarre reason that does not make sense because, because Trudeau just imitates what the EU does, but actually doesn't have, have like the teeth behind it to do anything. Uh, if you remember the, the trucker convoy, um, basically cracked down as if he were, you know, the French putting down protests. And then caved immediately on everything related to lockdown because because all the actual political factions in Canada are aligned with the U.S. and and only Trudeau and like a handful of people in Quebec have this idea that like Canada is somehow in the mid Atlantic instead of you know instead of across the river from Detroit which is what everyone in English Canada thinks of Canada as. So the, so the, basically the EU is going to, will probably heavily destabilize around the middle of the summer, right in time for election season in the U S um, the U S you know, who knows if someone makes, makes like an unbelievable move in the next few months, you can already, you already see political factions forming, especially with regards to the 
the border that, you know, right now it's symbolic, but it could get very non-symbolic very, very quickly, a lot of the opposition to it. And um, Canada, I don't think anyone has to actually worry about, is, is a farce right now. And most likely the country splits apart as it's always threatened to do at some point in the, the next six, six years. But I, if I was American, I wouldn't care. Well, let's make this a little darker. Um, yeah, you look at all these unfunded liabilities and historically a lot of the ways that they seek to get rid of these is to um, eliminate the population. Um, I, it could be that that's what it is unleashing the um, uh, unleashing the lower class upon uh, the middle class. Um, it also could be the them looking for war with Iran, which can, which can't be won in in my opinion. Well, I mean, it could be won if you drop nukes, but um, I don't think a conventional war could be won with Iran. Um, so, um, it's always it, it, it's always seemed to me that the way that they think about reducing some of these problems is to reduce the population. So that's been the traditional way to do it. That's been the way uh, that things like the French revolution or um, the Russian revolution have played out. The problem is um, basically in wealthy Western countries, there's no way to do it. Like, um, there's no so take your example war with Iran. Uh, in order to actually have like a population reduction from war with Iran in the U.S., you need to implement a massive tr draft to get people over there dying in Iran. I agree, Iran is a fight that basically the U.S. cannot win from any conventional sense. Um, you can invade through Iraq, but um, the Iraqis fucking hate them. America and it's a grand aligned power. Power the invading from the south that's going over mountains and basically would just be a meat a meat grinder and a logistical hell. Hell, but basically the US military is the smallest it's ever been. It's um well the smallest it's ever been since World War War Two. It's like a million point two, I think now. It's American recruitment capacity has reduced, reduced to a third of what it was in the 1980s relative to population. And pretty much there's no way for the U.S. to implement a draft for a war with Iran. Uh, America, Americans are, as, are more cynical than they have ever been in American history. And, and realistically, there's no capacity in the U.S. to draft people because a everyone every single person in america knows that if you dodge the draft or you don't go you'll get a pardon in under a decade uh this was clearly established by jimmy carter after vietnam the war was not the war was maybe four six years ended at that point you know it had been less than five years since saigon had actually fell fallen and jimmy carter pardoned every draft daughter Dodger as a vote winner. No one buys the idea that if they dodge the draft, it will haunt them for the rest of their life or it will, will impact their career going forward or that they'll be looked at as less of a man. They do know that if they go and have a limb blown off, the VA won't look after them. But um, more than that, if you actually tried to do the kind of stuff that the U.S. elite wishes they could do in America... You know, the kinds of stuff Ukraine has done, uh, set up hard checkpoints uh, on the U.S. side of the border for anyone trying to leave. Uh, right now, Americans can drive to Canada and not go past an American official. If you drive into America from Canada, then you go through a U.S. checkpoint. But basically, if you drive across the border, border there's, you know, it's up to a Canadian to check check who you are and what's happening and like pinky pro promise that that you're not planning anything so this is how everyone draft dodged in the 70s is they just drove across 
across the border said they were a tourist. And there's no way to really track that now. If the U.S. tried to impose pose no, what Ukraine imposed, so so Ukraine right now, you cannot leave the country. No one can leave the country between like ages seven and seventy-two. Um, no one, and then just start dragging people off the streets or start actually going to houses and dragging people out instead of like how the draft worked in the 70s which was if you didn't show up vo almost voluntarily like if you didn't show up to fulfill the draft at a certain time and date you know you wouldn't be a press gang wouldn't show up and drag you to vietnam a police officer would show up and take you to jail maybe possibly possibly which is like how much of an honor system the u.s has been on that it's never actually had to contemplate instituting blocker units or anything like that to actually get its people to fight. Whereas if they did try this, if they did try to try like Soviet tactics and like have press gangs and blocker units and have hard restrictions that no one could leave the country, that'd be the second they do that, that's a declaration of war on the American people and the American people will shoot back. Like um, there's very little that, We've seen that Americans are not willing to put up with, but basically anyone will shoot back at someone trying to drag their kids away, and Americans have the arms to shoot back. So the idea that they could do that or that this federal government could implement that is laughable. Um, I've written a piece on this about how a draft would be imperial suicide. If you add up every federal enforcement officer, every person that's empowered to make arrests on behalf of the federal government, everyone with a gun who's not in the U.S. Army and has, like, all these O's and concerns about about um, being deployed against the domestic population. If you add up the FBI, you know, the DEA, the Border, the border Patrol, the Coast Guard all these forces the u.s has has one enforcement office one federal enforcement officer for every 3,000 Americans Americans now you might say well there's the state police and the and the local police and all this and there's about a million of those so one for every 300 but the thing is the division of powers it's hard code in the u.s Constitution which all these Basically, every police officer in the U.S. is very keenly aware of who they answer to, how and why. Uh, county sheriffs pull tons of stuff that would never fly in another country in the world because they're very keenly aware that the only thing they answer to is is their voters. And like, I think maybe the state legislature can impeach them, impeach them. But that's the amount of power over a, over a county sheriff uh all the state state rangers and stuff know they answered to the state and it's been very clearly established uh by tons and tons of court cases that the federal government does not have the power to assume authority over over state police so if you think of illegal immigration well there are all these sanctuary cities de declared that that um basically city authority which isn't even a uh, federally recognized level of power that's a local authority technically it's the states that are actually answerable but all these cities declared that they would not enforce federal immigration law and the federal government was was helpless to do do a thing about it because there's decades and decades of press around that same with um Marijuana legalization. Marijuana remains federally illegal in all of the United States. Uh, technically, all the governors of the states that have legalized marijuana, every single one of them is running the equivalent of a of a drug cartel. That that's explicitly what they're doing. They're engaged in a price rigging rigging scheme in which they are the top top of to collect to fix the price of an illegal product of a controlled narcotic in the U.S. 
and they are collecting taxes and tribute on it and controlling who can and cannot sell it. That's definitionally a drug cartel. And every state governor that has legalized marijuana is running a drug cartel. And not only has the federal government been helpless to, to make state officials enforce federal law, um, they have not had the nerve at any point which this would be 100% legal, this would be 100% with U.S. federal law, but they've been absolutely helpless to arrest, arrest um, state officials for running drug cartels within the U.S. Like, technically, you could, you could arrest Gavin Newsom at any moment and charge him with kingpin charges and RICO Act and everything else related to trafficking marijuana, which would start a civil war if you did. And so the federal government has not. But there's, in a lab an extraordinary precedent around all the all the stuff that states do not have to, to enforce federal law so the federal government is just left realistically with its own enforcement agents which is which is about a hundred thousand people and about one per three three thousand americans to understand how small that is to understand how few enforcement agents that is in east germany on the eve of the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the fall of communism, do you know how many enforcement agents they had per person on the street? How many secret policemen, how many informants, how many people who were basically sworn to the East German government and had been, been arresting people within the past year? I do not. They had one person for every 50. So like 2% of, of people in East Germany were deputized informants or direct secret policemen or some other enforcement agency. It was, it was absolutely incredible. Like you could not speak to your spouse without concern that they might actually have secretly undergone one of these programs out at some point and be, be an informant. And the East German government fell then. Fell then. Um, if you look at Nazi Germany, Germany, the whole of whole of Germany, it was about one for every 150, if I'm remembering correctly, that um, actually one for every 300, sorry, that the S, that if you add up the SS, the Stasi, every, everything else, that's how many secret policemen or people empowered to make arrests that, that Germany had at that point. America... America technically is one for 300 if you include all local and state. But if you add up just what the federal government controls and can meaningfully call upon, it's one for 3,000. It's one, one tenth that. And Americans own more guns than any people have in the history of the world and has more criminals than any developed country has ever, ever had. If you add up everyone who's ever been arrested for a felony charge in the U S it's something like 50, 60 million million. It actually might be close to 80 at this, this point, but um, basically there's no way for the U S government to, to enforce anything resembling uh, a draft like you had in Ukraine. There's basically no way for the U S and government like any of the communist tricks to really like crack down on the population, like um, taking control of food supplies, uh, taking control of transportation, uh, confiscating, confiscating the means of production, all that stuff, the U.S. federal government has no capability to do it. It's laughable to imagine them trying. And the second they did try, what would happen is, is infrastructure would start getting attacked and government offices would start burning down and their capacity to enforce it even that little bit would collapse and probably the government shortly afterwards there's no way to enforce it it really does seem like the only way you're going to get americans to rise up is to cut off their cut off their welfare cut off their gibbs yeah um so right now, so the U.S. Unfunded Liability Scheme is probably the greatest pacification scheme that has ever existed because you have all this money that's throughout your life in some form of transit through the federal government. 
And as you get closer to like really understanding pro politics towards the end of life and really getting invested in all of this, well, you're right towards the end where you're going to be one of the ones on the receiving end. And it cuts through families. It cuts through, through communities because it's not a transfer from one ethnicity to another, although it is as well. The main structure of it, the primary thing that's happening is a massive transfer from young to young to old and you know the federal bureaucracy the corrupt classes the the specific ethnicities that populate those you know they're just skimming off of that that and americans don't even feel the skim because the federal government has been paying out three dollars for every two it took in for 40 50 years so even if they're skimming off you know one fifth or one six six the average American over their lifetime is receiving more money from the federal government than they pay in. Pay in. So that's a, an incredible pacification scheme. And, and this is why American politics seems so incredibly uh, low stakes compared to any other era in history. Nothing ever happens. So this is the reason nothing ever happens is because if anything ever happened, you know, all this money that's being sloshed down from future generations to the present would stop. Stop. And so you have this wealth of aging boomers, this wealth of women, the this wealth of federal retirees, this wealth of current federal employees, this wealth of people nearing retirement who who have already paid in paid in more than they're ever going to pay in after after all these people have a incredible vested interest in seeing seeing those checks flow flow and none of them want to heavily disrupt it this is why it's only like autistic libertarians who point to to welfare or any anything else and like bitch and complain about how it's distorting the market and like destroying all the wealth that could be like you have to be really paying attention and crunching the numbers to notice that because no one actually feels it Everyone just feels that like, oh, taxes, that sucks, but I get money back, woohoo, who, and oh, I have these entitlements I can depend on. And as soon as you care, you're a net benefit. You really care and have time to notice you're, you're getting close to being a beneficiary, so you aren't going to rock the boat. As soon as this goes, all of a sudden the America is like a normal historical country again that existed before 1945. As soon as, as soon as inflation encroaches up so high, or um, heaven help them if they default, start defaulting on the checks, or as soon as, or as soon as some other system starts going, it'll, it'll almost certainly be inflation. I can't imagine any of them would actually have the stones to save the American dollar by defaulting on it. Although maybe, uh, if Jerome Powell's in charge and private equity really squeezes down, and tries to save the U.S. dollar. Dollar might be that they just start, you know, f mass firing federal employees, which like seems to be maybe what's been hinted at by by some people that that's who they've decided is going to lose from all this, and they'll they'll start confiscating university endowments and stuff like that. Like that'd be the most based realistic way to do it. So I don't expect it to happen, but you know maybe that's the gear that's turning in someone's head who's donating donating millions of dollars to trump but realistically once all this all this starts going american politics gets damned high stakes damned fast uh all suddenly you'll see fighting in the streets like you see in argentina over Millet's policies or um or you'll see like factions forming and having shootouts with each other like weimar or you'll see an act actual revolution like in France in the 1780s and 90s like um as soon as as soon as politics stops being being you know who's getting all this this money stolen from the future instead becomes who's getting the last of the money we're stealing from the present that becomes very high stakes it's, and like a lot of people will see their projected net worth reduced like I said, by 
Right now, it's six hundred thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child that's owed to someone else in America through the federal government. That's not going to get paid uh, between now and when it's a million and twenty dollars in twenty thirty. Uh, you know, Americans are going to become painfully aware that that money is missing, and they're going to start asking themselves, "Well, who can this be carved out of?" So, so I. I wouldn't like to be someone depending on a university pension. I wouldn't like to be someone depending on a government pension. I wouldn't like to be, I wouldn't like to be someone who's, who's like deeply in, invested in any uh, form of long-term GIC or government bond. Uh, some of those lock in, in for five or so years. I, I would not, if anything, if you have to hold hold bonds, hold the liquid ones that can be sold off. But yeah, no, it will be. It will get dark, and it probably won't get lighter. Like um, once you're in history, you're in history. Like this, and this is what Americans largely don't get is that that what existed from 1945 really 1952 to today day is like this anomalous bubble that's that has been created by a whole lot of policies that were not sustainable and were designed to basically create a population that would be servile to the federal government um as soon as that system is gone like you have to read about the 19th century or read or read about you know the early 20th century to really get a feel for what life is going to be like um i don't you mentioned starvation and population reduction i don't think it's possible to starve a world first world country anymore um like unless you controlled all four borders like um like Germany after 45, they had endured an artificial famine that was mercifully cut much shorter than was planned by FDR, largely because FDR died. The, like, unless you're in that state where you can enforce a military occupation, uh, first world countries, you can't really starve. Uh, if you look at the purchasing powers of Americans, even if that's reduced to like a quarter of what it is, uh, Americans on the world stage, their spending capacity drowns out so many third and second world countries that if there's there's food scarcity anywhere, it won't be America because they can just buy it. Uh, the And it's... This goes doubly when you look at like um, the capital stocks in the U.S. and and all the things that if you had to like pry enough copper wire out of the U.S. to buy food, you could. Uh, what will likely happen is once the U.S. empire starts sliding, global trade collapses. This uh, Peter Zihan is not a very good follow. Uh, he's He's a CIA carve-out neocon sh shill, but his graphs are very good, and his book on on the end of globalism was very good. And basically, the drum he's been beating for for five years is that there's no way for the American in the American system for the U.S. to actually secure the world's trade lanes. And as soon as that starts going, which we're already seeing with um, the hoop these attacking shipping off of um, the Strait of Tears um, in the Red Sea is that is that once enough ships go down, the cost of insurance out of Lloyd's of London skyrockets. Uh, so all shipping in the world is secured through one one insurance company that's been around since the 1700s, Lloyd's of London, one of the oldest financial institutions in existence. Uh, no one ever has to know about it because it's largely boring and it does boring, boring stuff. And it's not eventful. It's not like a choke point of world power or anything, but it does its job and it's, it ensures all the shipping around the world. And this is why uh, right now to ship anything 
around the world, as long as you're at port and can load it up quickly, shipping something around the world costs less than like driving it 20 kilometers. Uh, the one of the big things, is, for example, is uh, Argentine peaches. Uh, what they'll do is they'll load them in a shipping container, ship it to, to um, Indonesia. They'll ripen in the container. They'll get get processed in Indonesia by workers making, I don't know, a few dollars a day, a day, put in cans, and then that ships all over the world. And if you get get canned peaches from Argentina in your local shop that's the process they went on is they were sh shipped all the way from argentina to indonesia ripened on the way got canned and then was shipped back to you and the most expensive part of that process was the last hundred kilometers where it was driven to your grocery store this is how efficient international shipping is it's it's insane and and all of global food supplies largely depend on that except for north america north america it's all trucking ecosystem because north american internal shipping is a mess because of the jones act and north america is one of the world's largest food net exporters borders and it covers almost all its own food import except for like odd specialized stuff like produce and other things that americans largely don't eat but um the Basically, if if ten to twenty container ships sink, and Lloyd's of London has to pay out on that, the premiums on shipping insurance goes through the roof, and all these little schemes like that become unsustainable, and the marginal cost on anything that goes on a container ship increases in proportion to to its weight. So one of the big things is that food production around the world, food production in Africa, India, China, and basically that entire belt, anywhere there's a lot of people and a lot of, a lot of food, um, all that depends on potash exports and artificial fertilizer, and, and that disappears in a collapse scenario like that list did below. So... U.S. food food would be very very secure. Secure, basically anywhere in the populous parts of Asia or Africa would not be. And even if you have money in those parts, you're going to be outbid by the U.S. So, so that's my logic. There really isn't a way for the elites to actually the governing to elite to actually win and implement any of their totalitarian dreams. They're not competent enough to do it any, anyway. Like these are the fail sons of the fail sons of the people who actually implemented this system. And they have no idea how any of the things they are actually touching work. Uh, probably what's going to happen is there's just going to be something like the 30 years war where there's just unending civil wars across America and Europe and most of Asia and most of the third world will endure horrible famines throughout this period. But that's probably the most likely scenario. Um, I have an entire theory of a governing system that could replace this and should replace this and I think would be competitive for it, but that's entire, that's three pieces down the road that I'm writing. But, um, but yeah, so that's what's in the next 15 years of your reader's future. Um, buy guns, stock up on on food stuff, stock up. If you live in the country or anything, like get a way to produce food locally, like start gardening or something like that. Because even if you can't feed yourself through it, you might be able to like um, produce produce things that that will like supplement your nutri nutrition so any vitamins are missing and stuff but realistically 
North America is going to have political violence. Uh, Europe is going to have a lot of political violence. Uh, the empire will fall. Uh, your assets, if they're in any paper asset, probably aren't that secure. Um, if you have a crap car and a lot of stocks, it's probably well worth it to convert some of those stocks into a good car. But um, realistically, I can't imagine a scenario where the elite are able to impose more more costs on the populace than the populace is able to impose on, on the elite. Just the way first worlders live their lifestyle now, unless you're in like a fish tank apartment and actually don't own, own anything. You just have paper assets that go to zero. Um, you, you or your family probably have a way to ride this out. All right, well, that might be the most blackpilling episode we've had in a while. Um, I I always think of it as a white pill. I I would think it much darker if the current system was sustainable and we were just on a long trek to to brave new world totalitarianism. Uh, uh, you know, great reset social credit state where no one is ever free again. Uh, the idea that it's all going to collapse into chaos is like, like um, that's the kind of environment that favors intelligent young men of um, of European descent or European temp temperament. If you're not of European descent, like this is these are the eras that produce Napoleons and and his marshals. These are the eras that produce great adventurers. These are the eras that produce great great artists it'll be unpleasant but you'll probably su survive it and if you have any latent potential and you know, this would be like a once in a century opportunity to live up to it all right let's end it right there tell people where they can uh, find your stuff all right so you can find me at anarchonomicon dot dot com on subs Substack, and um, you can follow me at from Kulak on Twitter. I am Cat Girl Kulak. You will know me by the cats in my um, in my name tag. All right, Kulak. Thank you very much. You take care. Have a good night. All right.